was in. You, you can't be serious. What is going wrong? Maybe, maybe I don't know how to play tennis at all. Out! Maybe, maybe I should put more spin on the ball. Yeah, spin on the ball. Yeah, that's it, Magnus Force. I should have known. So I just so happened to have a tennis ball already set in the wind tunnel that we can measure the lift force as a function of rotation. Let me show you what I got. So here's the tennis ball. You can see it's on a sting, and the sting is connected to this Dremel tool. With this, I can drive the tennis ball up to 30,000 RPMs. Underneath, I've got a load balance, a load cell, that will collect the force of the tennis ball as a function of rotation. Right. I take the data here again with the computer. So in order to get this rig running, the first thing I have to do is calibrate it. So we'll start by putting some weights on the force balance. So what I'm doing here is averaging the voltage coming off the force balance. I'll average it for 30 seconds or so, and then we'll take another reading with a different weight. I'll repeat this process for several weights, and we can create a graph of voltage versus force. So now that the force balance is calibrated, we can take some data. What we want to do is, when we collect the data, we want to non-dimensionalize it. So any data that I take here at Marquette, I can compare with other people's data. The way we're going to non-dimensionalize is, we'll non-dimensionalize the lift force as the force of lift divided by the dynamic pressure times the area. And this is the projected area. So in this case, we're dealing with the sphere. So this will be lift, and the projected area will still be the dynamic pressure times the area of the projected area of the ball. We want to non-dimensionalize the spin as well. So there's a dimensionless equation for spin rate, and it's basically the tangential velocity, omega r, divided by the speed of the wind tunnel. If we non-dimensionalize our data in this way, we can compare anybody's data to anybody else's data. All right, so what we're going to do now is close the wind tunnel up. And we'll turn it on. And as it comes up to speed, we can monitor the velocity of the wind tunnel with our manometer. So you can see the red dye is coming on up as the velocity of the wind tunnel increases, 0 0.15, 0 0.16, 0 0.17 inches of water. Then I'm going to turn on the Dremel, get this thing spinning. All right. Now I'm going to measure the rotation rate with a strobe. So as I adjust the speed of the strobe, I can effectively stop the sting from spinning, and in so doing, I know how fast it's spinning. That's about there. We're at about 5,000 RPMs here, which is pretty good. So now we're ready to take data, and uh, every second it's taking 3,000 data points. So this is our data here coming across. You can see that there's some strong periodicity in the data. And then the average of this is being recorded here. This is the ensemble average. So this is a continuous rolling average of the data, representing the voltage coming off of the force balance. We've already calibrated the force balance, so I can convert this voltage then to a mass. I'm going to repeat this over a range of wind speeds and RPMs to, cr to construct a graph of what the lift force is as a function of RPM and wind speed.
All right, so let's have a look at some of the data. This is a plot showing the average ensemble voltage that we collected during the calibration plotted against the masses that we placed on the ball. I've converted the mass to force here just by multiplying by the gravitational acceleration. So I have two sets of data here. I have this first data set that I collected, and you can see that there's an offset voltage here. So I uh, zeroed out the offset voltage by changing the balance and got a second set of data. I then curve fit this data, and you can see that um, it's fairly linear over the range that we're interested in, so from forces of uh, zero to one newtons. And, um, and so we can use this data right here to convert the voltages that we collect when the ball is spinning uh, to a force. So this is how we get the data off of the force balance. And just to remind you, this is how we're going to plot the data. I've got dimensionless spin ratio and uh, the measured lift here uh, in a uh, coefficient of lift. And then I've also got the theoretical coefficient of lift from the inviscid theory. Now, in class, I had calculated that for <clears throat> a circular cylinder. And um, here, I just went ahead and pulled this off of this NASA website. So you can have a look at that derivation if you would like. Recall, for the circular cylinder, this was 2 pi. So it's quite a big difference between the sphere and the circular cylinder, as you would expect. So here is the theoretical lift curve, spin rate versus coefficient of lift. And then here's the data that we collected. So you can see we're quite far from the theoretical prediction. This is some data from Lindsay and Cross that uh, I thought I'd put on here just to compare our data with. And what's nice about their data is they're able to get down into this low uh, spin rate regime. And you can see it looks like for, as the spin rate goes to zero, the lift is going to zero, which makes a lot of sense. I thought I'd also put up some smooth curve data um, uh, some smooth sphere data. And this is, uh, I had talked about this data in the lecture. And you notice that it has this, or ex it exhibits this negative Magnus force effect, which really comes about as a uh, boundary layer transition. So uh, when the ball is slightly spinning, it's uh, possible to transition one side of the boundary layer, uh, one side of the ball's boundary layer before the other, which shifts the wake in such a way that you get negative lift. Now, uh, on the, for the fuzziness of the tennis ball, uh, the boundary layer is pretty much always turbulent. So you don't get this negative lift effect. You pretty much just get a straight response right off of the ball, a linear response. So that's why we don't see the uh, negative effect. And that's why we're kind of shifted over towards uh, lower spin rates. I think it's interesting to have a look at what uh, real tennis uh, players, <laughs> unlike myself, how they perform on this spin rate lift coefficient curve. So here's Roger Federer at all, and you can see this is data taken from the 2009-2010 hard court season. This is kind of the average velocity, shot velocity, and an average spin rate. And the spin ratio, which is kind of interesting, the dimensionless spin ratio, they're all about the same. So even though their average shot velocities are rather different, really, uh, their spin ratios uh, turn out to be the same because they're imparting different spin on the ball. So ultimately, they're all generating about the same amount of lift force. And if I put that lift force on the curve, it's around 0.1. So they're all in this region, which is really kind of interesting. Now, if we were to talk about that boundary layer transition, uh, the turbulent boundary layer versus the laminar boundary layer, this is a nice plot showing uh, the variation of lift on a sphere with turbulent and laminar boundary layer. So we're talking about the boundary layer on the ball being uh, completely turbulent or completely laminar. And you can see that initially uh, for the laminar boundary layer, you can get a transition. One side of the ball can become turbulent versus the other, which can shift the wake uh, and produce a negative lift force as shown here. And then once the other side transitions to turbulent, it pretty much joins the turbulent uh, profile. So this is the lift, and this is the drag. Now in drag, you have pretty much a flat response except for the low spin rates. <clears throat> and what's happening here is, is that uh, the boundary layer uh, 
is because we have a, a narrower wake, you get re a reduction in drag for the turbulent uh, uh, boundary layer versus the laminar. We'll talk more about that when we do external aerodynamics, but right now the takeaway message is you can get a reduction in drag for a forced turbulent boundary layer, which is why golf balls have dimples on them. Great, so now I know if I increase the spin ratio, I can increase the lift or downforce on the ball and improve my tennis shot. I think I want to give it a try. Oh, this is going to be great. So now that we've measured the Magnus force in the lab, we can try it out here at the tennis court. I've got here a ball machine, and this ball machine has two rotating drums that can launch the ball at a given spin. I can control the spin of the drums with the control panel in the back. I can set the speed at which it fires and the rotation rate, either top spin or back spin. Once we fire a few balls, we could then make a prediction about what the aerodynamic path is by knowing the coefficient of lift and the coefficient of drag on a tennis ball. Let's try it out. So we're setting up a high-speed camera so that we can measure the initial conditions of the tennis ball. Our high-speed camera is set over here, and it can go up to 1,000 frames per second. The ball will come out of the hopper, and what we'd like to know is what the initial velocity is, what the angle to the ground is, and most importantly, what the spin rate is. With these conditions, we can calculate the trajectory of the ball. Take it just, yeah, this is full top spin. All right. So this should be cranking with spin. So it is different trajectory. Five, these will be all zero spin. that we've shot a few balls with top spin, with no spin, and with back spin, we placed cones where the ball was landing. And I'm going to measure the distance from the hopper to the cones. This is the average location for each ball. This is the top spin, this is the flat spin, and the far cone is the back spin. So you can see it made a huge difference as to which way the ball was rotating as to how far the ball traveled. I'm going to record these distances so we can use this data to verify how good our calculations were. All right, so now that we have the lift and drag data from the wind tunnel and we have the video records, we can put it all together to make a complete story of what's going on with the flight of the tennis ball. And maybe it'll help me improve my tennis serve. So here's some video records. These are the high-speed video records. And you can see the ball looks like it knuckled right across that screen. And here, this is the backspin. And you can see from the logo that there's definitely backspin on the ball. And here, you can see that there's topspin. So we have those three shots to work with. Each frame that I showed you is one thousandth of a second apart, so we shot this uh, going pretty fast. And then uh, you'll see a series of commands at the bottom, and this is just how I post-processed these images. If you're interested in trying this out yourself, uh, feel free. This is using FFmpeg on a Darwin machine. So in order to get the initial velocity of launch, what we can do is I can superimpose a bunch of these images together. And because I also had taken a reference frame uh, shot with a, uh, a ruler in it, I know what the distances are. So I can calculate what the distance per pixel for each image is. And from that, then, I can calculate the distance the ball has traveled over 15 frames. So if I know the distance it traveled and the number of frames, I can calculate the speed, right? So that would be the distance divided by 14, because if there's 15 frames, there's 14 time differences. 
times the thousand frames per second gives me a launch velocity of about 20.16 meters per second or 45 miles per hour. If I want to know the launch angle, I can do pretty much the same thing. I know what the, what the x and y distances traversed over this time record are, and so I can calculate the, the geometry uh, from that. So it's just a simple arc tangent of the y over x, 21 degrees. And this is for the no spin rate. <clears throat> I can repeat this for the back spin and get, and get the initial launch velocity and the launch angle, which is pretty close to to what it was for the no spin. Remember, this is just the machine firing one ball after the other, so we're hopefully getting consistent results. And then to get the spin rate, what I can do is I can just look at four images uh, from those 15 images, and then I can superimpose a fiducial over each ball just to kind of get an idea of what the rotation is. And I'd say, <clears throat> given the resolution that we have, both time and space, that's about a half a revolution over those uh, 14 time differences. So that would work out to be about 2142 RPM. I can do the same thing with the top spin. I can first calculate its distance traversed over those frames and its angle. And again, I'm getting about 20 meters per second and an angle of 20 uh, degree launch. And then uh, calculate the spin based on what we see, based on the logo, really. And it looks like it'd be fair to call that about a half a revolution over the 15 frames as well. So we get about minus 2142. Remember, this whole minus plus sign when it comes to lift and drag data can be problematic. So from this data, <clears throat> from these initial conditions, we could calculate the trajectory that the ball has traveled. So this is a simple uh, MA equals the sum of forces kind of calculation everybody's favorite. And this is the acceleration here, and this is the mass of the tennis ball. And in the x direction, I have two forces, the lift and the drag. And in the y, uh, I've got an additional gravitational term. So I need to know the lift and drag coefficient. I can get it right from this data right here. So here is our tennis ball data and the data of Cross and Lindsay. And I'm just going to fit a straight line through there. So it's a linear fit with respect to spin ratio times, times the slope of that line. And for the drag data, I think I'll simplify it and just, just assume constant drag over the velocity and spin rates. Uh, just another simplifying assumptions. So I know the mass and the radius of the tennis ball. So I pretty much have a well-posed problem. And I can use Runjakutta either in MATLAB or uh, uh, write my own in Fortran. To, uh, to calculate the trajectory and time. All right. So here's a set of images that we took. Now, this is multiple shots from the ball machine that I've superimposed. And you can see, here's how I superimposed them. You can see me. Uh, that's me moving around in the, in, in the field of view, so I'm kind of blurred there. But what, you really, what I really want you to focus on is notice that uh, there are multiple appearances of the ball. And you can see kind of the scatter in the data uh, so that's showing you kind of the variation there in the trajectory from one shot to the other. I can just fit this with a, with a line. I just kind of freehand drew that in PowerPoint to, uh, to illustrate where the trajectory is. And then using that Runjikata scheme I just described, I can calculate the trajectory. The measured distance from the tennis court was 20.29 meters, and the calculated, simulated, trajectory went about 20.1 meters. So that's really quite good agreement for a linear curve fit for lift and a constant drag. You can see some variation here with respect to the experiment and the simulation. And I would take that with a grain of salt, because there's a lot of fisheye effect on this image. You can see here that this line, this tennis court line, appears rather bent right, in the image. So. Uh, it's not exactly uh, fair to compare this fisheye image to the perfect aspect ratio of the simulation that I just superimposed on this image. You can see here the American flag does not appear rectangular. So all of this is uh, factors into our, what we see here. That ball looks like it had been a little bit long, right? So no spin there still a bit long. Here's our backspin trajectory. Again, I've superimposed a lot of the shots 
so that you can see where the, where the ball traveled. And I'm just going to draw over it and overlay the simulation. So again, it's quite good. I get 22.7 uh, uh, predicted versus a 23.7 measured. And that ball was definitely out. Here is our top spin trajectory. Uh, again, we can overlay them. And it looks like we hit one of the cones in the record. So you can see our marker cone went squirting off to the side there. And then I can overlay the simulation. And again, quite good results. But I'd say with that top spin, it looks like that serve went in. So that's what we're after. Here's just a comparison of all of the data, top spin, flat spin, and back spin. And here's a comparison of the simulations. So with this information, I think I need a little more topspin on my serve. So I hope you enjoyed this demonstration of Magnus Force, and you learned a little something about how spin affects aerodynamics. We're going to compare this data, uh, and I'll post the data up on the D2L website so you can compare it directly. I hope you enjoyed it. We'll see you next time.